And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker. That's Dr. Joseph Sperano from the Icahn School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. And he will be presenting the trial assigning individualized options for treatment, or TaylorX, an update including 12-year event rates. Dr. Sperano. Dr. Goel, Dr. Partridge, um, on behalf of the TaylorX investigators, it's my privilege to present an update of the TaylorX trial, including 12-year uh, event rates. This NCI-sponsored trial was coordinated by the ecog Akron Cancer Research Group in collaboration with all other cooperative groups and was supported with funding not only from NCI, but also from the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, Komen Foundation, and the U.S. Postal Service Stamp Fund. The study design and accrual are depicted here. After eligibility, verification, and consent, study volunteers were pre-registered and had a tumor specimen sent to the Genomic Health Laboratory for the recurrent score assay. Upon receipt of the results by the local site, subjects were then registered and treatment assignment or randomization uh, was uh, directed as shown. 10,273 volunteers were registered between April of 2006 and October of 2000. 10, resulting in 6,711 available subjects, or 65 percent, in the recurrent score 11 to 25 group, uh, randomized to receive endocrine therapy plus chemotherapy, um, the standard arm or endocrine therapy alone, the experimental arm. The remaining 35 percent were assigned to receive endocrine therapy alone if the recurrent score was 0 to 10, and chemo plus endocrine therapy if the recurrent score was 26 to 100. The trial employed a non-inferiority design for the recurrent score 11 to 25 arms with invasive disease-free survival as the primary endpoint and with a margin, a hazard ratio margin of 1.332 um, as a uh, conclusion of non-inferiority. The analysis were conducted at full information after 836 uh, disease-free um, events. Um, in the recurrent score 11 to 25 group after a median follow-up of 7.5 years. The main study findings included the following. For the recurrent score 0 to 10 group assigned to endocrine therapy alone, distant relapse-free interval rates were 99 percent in 5 years and 97 percent in 9 years. For those with a mid-range recurrent score of 11 to 25, uh, endocrine therapy was non-inferior to chemoendocrine therapy for invasive disease-free survival and distant relip relapse-free interval, the primary and secondary endpoints respectively. Relapse-free interval and overall survival were also similar. For those with a high recurrent score of 26 to 100 assigned to endocrine therapy, high recurrent score was prognostic for high recurrence uh, risk. The estimated absolute chemotherapy benefit ranged from about 8 percent if the recurrent score was 8 to, to excuse me, 30, uh, 26 to 30 and approximately 30 percent if the recurrent score was greater than 30 based on the estimate, uh, estimated chemotherapy benefit observed in the B20 prospective validation trial. Other key study findings that were secondary or exploratory included the following. First, clinical pathologic factors such as tumor size, uh, grade and age, and provide added prognostic information to recurrent score but not predictive information for chemotherapy benefit. Second, there was some chemotherapy benefit noted for women with a recur up to 50 years of age with a recurrent score of 16 to 25. Third, integration of the recurrent score plus the clinical pathologic features yielded more prognostic information than either alone, leading to the development of the online RS Clin tool. And finally, additional post hoc exploratory analysis revealed that although black race was associated with worse outcomes than other races, recurrent score was still prognostic for recurrence and predicted for lack of chemotherapy benefit. Differences in early discontinuation of endocrine therapy, clinical pathologic features, insurance coverage, and the neighborhood def uh, deprivation index did not fully explain these disparities. The rationale for conducting the updated analysis are shown in this slide. First and foremost, the annual recurrence risk for ER-positive HER2-negative disease persists for up to 20 years or longer. In fact, at least one half of recurrences develop more than five years after diagnosis, which has been termed late recurrence. The TaylorX design pre-specified follow-up for up to 20 years in order to assure adequate follow-up for late relapse. The median follow-up at the time of the original TaylorX report was 7.5 years and the median duration of endocrine th uh, therapy was 5.1 years. 
Updated analysis at this time provides substantially more information regarding late recurrence risk. There was a longer median follow-up out to 11 years in the randomized group of, with a recurrence score of 11 to, uh, to 25 and 10.4 years in the overall population. With this additional follow-up, there were also substantially more events, including all arms, compared with the primary analysis, including 50% more distant recurrence events in the recurrence score 11 to 25 group. The methods for this analysis are shown here. The same ITT population previously reported in the primary analysis was also used. Event-free rates were estimated using the Kaplan-Meier method and results displayed, uh, including the standard error. Hazard ratios were estimated using partial likelihood uh, analysis of the Cox proportional hazard model. Self-reported race and clinical risk were also examined as covariates. There were no corrections for multiple comparisons. Kaplan-Meier curves for the recurrence score 11 to 25 arms are shown here. As in the primary analysis, there were no significant differences in the updated analysis when comparing endocrine therapy and chemoendocrine therapy for invasive disease-free survival, distant relapse-free interval, relapse-free interval, or overall survival. Five and 12-year event rates for the recurrence score 11 to 25 arms are shown here. Distant recurrence rates were about 7% at 12 years, irrespective of chemotherapy use, averaging a rate of about 0.5% per year. Late exceeded early recurrences. Relapse-free interval rates at 5 and 12 years were 97 and 90% respectively, with a similar pattern for distant recurrence rates. And non-recurrence events reflected by the difference between the invasive disease-free survival endpoint and relapse-free interval rates occurred in 13% of 12 years, averaging about 1% per year. Overall survival rates were similar, with most, most deaths occurring after five years. The Kaplan-Meier curves for all four endpoints and all trial arms are shown here for the overall population. Recurrence score was prognostic for all four endpoints with a recurrence score of greater than 25, displaying the most discriminatory um, evidence for prognosis as shown by the Kaplan-Meier curves. For the recurrence score zero to 10 group, treated with endocrine therapy alone, distant and overall recurrence-free interval rates at 12 years were 93 and 91%. For the recurrence score 11 to 25 group, there was a less than 1% difference for all endpoints when comparing endocrine therapy with chemoendocrine therapy at 12 years. For the recurrence score 26 to 100 group, event rates were substantially higher uh, when compared with the lower recurrence score despite the use of adjuvant chemotherapy in addition to endocrine therapy. Shown here are the DRFI and RFI event rates for the recurrence score 11 to 25 arms in women 50 or younger, with the comparisons of endocrine therapy with chemoendocrine therapy stratified by recurrence score within this range. There was no chemo benefit in the recurrence score 11 to 15 group, as shown here, with uh, DRFI rates um, exceeding 95% at 12 years with endocrine therapy alone. There was a marginal chemo benefit in the recurrence score 16 to 20 group with a less than 1% difference in DRFI at 12 years. There was, uh, there was benefit uh, evident for the recurrence score 11 to 25 group with the absolute difference of about 8% for DRFI at 12 years. The absolute benefit associated with chemotherapy is a function of the relative uh, reduction associated with chemotherapy use and the underlying risk of recurrence. In addition, for premenopausal women, chemotherapy-induced menopause drives some chemo benefit. In order to disentangle these factors driving chemo benefit, we further evaluated the impact of the recurrence score and clinical risk on the absolute differences of 12 years for distant recurrence rates associated with chemotherapy use in women 50 or younger with a recurrence score of 16 to 25. 
When stratified by age and menopausal status in the forest plots, there was a statistically significant three-way interaction between chemo use, age, and recurrence score for invasive disease-free survival. Although the interaction p-value was not significant for distant recurrence, the forest plot uh, showed chemo benefit in preventing distant recurrence for women 46 to 50 and premenopausal, an age at which chemotherapy-associated menopause is most likely to occur. We used the binary clinical risk categorization employed in, in the MINDAC trial where low risk was calibrated to at least a 92% 10-year breast cancer-specific survival for endocrine therapy alone based on version 8.0 of adjuvant online. Low risk was defined as a tumor up to one centimeter in high grade, two centimeters in intermediate grade, or three centimeters in low grade. And high risk was defined as not meeting the low risk criteria. When stratified by clinical risk, there was an absolute 7.8% uh, chemo benefit in the recurrent score 21 to 25 group. In contrast, there was only a 0.4% absolute chemotherapy benefit for recurrent score of 16 to 20. When further stratified by clinical risk, there was no benefit for low clinical risk patients and a recurrent score of 16 to 20. And 3.1% for the same recurrent score group and high clinical risk. But for the recurrent score 21 to 25 group, there was a 5.9% benefit for low clinical risk and 11.7% benefit for high clinical risk. Shown here are the outcomes by time period after diagnosis and also by self-reported race. The estimated annual hazard rate for distant recurrence was rel relatively stable over 12 years, averaging about 0.5% annually. For the other endpoint, endpoints, annual rates were higher after five years, including um, overall uh, relapse, including local, regional, and distant relapse, um, and death. When we evaluated outcomes by race and, and time period and models adjusted for other factors, black race was associated with about a twofold and statistically significantly higher event rate for all events in years one through five, but not years six uh, through five in models unadjusted for other factors. The adverse impact of race largely held up in this early period, but was modestly attenuated when the models were adjusted for age, tumor size, grade, recurrence score, and insurance status. In conclusion, in this updated uh, analysis of Taylor X, there was longer median follow-up and more events in the randomized group. The main study findings remain unchanged for the recurrence score 11 to 25 uh, arms. Endocrine therapy was not inferior to chemoendocrine therapy, for invasive disease-free survival, the primary endpoint, and distant relapse-free interval, the secondary endpoint. Relapse-free interval and overall survival rates were also similar. Other exploratory key study findings were also similar to the original analysis. There was chemo benefit for women 50 or under with a recurrent score of 21 to 25. That was substantial. There was also some chemo benefit for women 50 or under with a recurrent score of 16 to 20 and high clinical risk. New findings of this updated analysis, which should be regarded as exploratory, include the fact that uh, late recurrence beyond five years uh, exceeded early recurrence, although that's highly consistent with previous work, and um, racial disparities for black women were associated with early but not late recurrence. I once again would like to um, acknowledge and thank uh, the funders, including the NCI, the U.S. Breast Cancer Research Stamp Fund, Breast Cancer Research Foundation, the Susan G. Komen Foundation, uh, the advocate community that supported this trial, the multiple collaborating groups named here, the participating sites, including um, physicians, nurses, physicians assistants, research coordinators and assistants, and our collaborators at Genomic Health. And most importantly, I'd like to thank the 10,273 uh, volunteers, Taylor X volunteers, um, some of whom I treated, had the privilege of treating, are shown here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Sperano, for that excellent presentation. And we look forward now to questions from the audience. We'll start with microphone four, please. Uh, Hal, Hal Burstein from Boston. Joe, fantastic to see the follow-up. And 
as it relates to the previous presentation on cognitive dysfunction, uh, the one way to prevent chemo-induced cognitive dysfunction is not to give unnecessary chemotherapy, so it's phenomenal that we can avoid that. For premenopausal women, you've consistently shown that women less than age 40 don't seem to benefit from chemo, whereas women in their 40s might. And the only way I can square that is to imagine that the vast majority of the difference is from chemotherapy-induced menopause. Is there any way to tease it out? Uh, I know you did the three-way thing, but is there any way to tease it out more concretely than that? At this time, with the, with the information that we have, I don't think so. Um, I think we're truly in a situation of um, equipoise, and I think it provides really sound justification for the planned NRG trial that will randomize patients who fall in these equipoise groups to chemoendocrine therapy versus endocrine therapy alone. I, I agree with your assessment. I do have concerns that those women who are 40 or under who um, participated in this trial may have been highly selected. And so for that reason, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be a little concerned about drawing um, that conclusion uh, that those patients truly don't benefit. Uh, microphone five, please. Eric Weiner. Uh, Joe, if there's no benefit overall, and yet there's benefit in the premenopausal subset, does that mean there's harm in the postmenopausal women associated with chemotherapy? Um, no, there does not appear to be based on the uh, stratified analyses looking specifically at, at the postmenopausal group. Um, it, there was only, you may recall that there was really no difference in the overall population. Um, about two-thirds of the patients in the trial were postmenopausal, about or, or, or older than 50, about um, one-third were 50 or under. Um, and the group with a recurrence score of 16 to 25 represents only a fraction of the younger group. So um, I think when you, when you um, and, and for that reason, it, it just, it, it, it has a, a really overall small effect on the entire uh, randomized comparison. Thanks. Thank you. Microphone three. University College London. Um, interesting data. Um, the EBC-TCG meta-analyses of 2012 and 2019 show that in patients with ER positive HER2 negative, oh, sorry, ER positive breast cancer, uh, there are very few recurrence events after five years that can be influenced by chemotherapy, and almost none after about seven and a half years. Uh, do you think that data affects your conclusions in any way? I think this data uh, is reassuring evidence that we, w we wouldn't see, um, that we w uh, see a lack of, of, of benefit or, or beyond five years. Um, our data are, are really consistent with that. Um, however, since we, we, we didn't really see a benefit for chemotherapy in the overall population, um, with shorter follow-up, we, we didn't really expect to see benefit emerge with longer follow-up, but it, it's still reassuring to see that with this long degree of follow-up, the, the primary trial conclusions remain unchanged. We have time for one more question. A microphone four, please. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Matthew Getz from Mayo Clinic. Just excellent presentation. Question is, we, we, have, the, we have the data from Marx Ponder where we see benefit of chemotherapy regardless of the recurrence score in you know, the premenopausal patients or age less than 50. Here we're, we're looking at you know, slight differences in the recurrence score and we're saying that one group gets it versus not. What's the chance that this is just chance? And really at the end of the day, the proportional reductions are the same, but we're, you're just enrolling such a good risk population, so we're, we're unable to see the differences. I agree with, I agree with your point. Um, it's, it's difficult to disentangle the, the um, effects of chemotherapy that are, are, are driven, the beneficial effects that may be driven by bringing on early menopause versus a true cytotoxic effect in eradicating micrometastatic disease. Um, and the, 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 the discordance that we see in the two trials can be exactly what you're suggesting, that it may be just a function of the higher clinical risk in the Rx bonder patients that do allow you to, to detect a marginal uh, benefit from chemotherapy that's being driven by uh, early induction of menopause. Thank you very much, Dr. Sperano, for your presentation once again.
it's clear from the number of questions we also received online um, that there's a lot of interest in that presentation.